Let's begin reading together here in John 14 at verse 1. I'll read to verse 6 and we'll get into our study. John chapter 14, beginning at verse 1, reading to verse 6. Jesus says, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And where I go, you know, and the way, you know. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you're going, and how can we know the way? And Jesus said to him, shut up. (laughs) You bother me. No, he said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. So, as we look at this, let me give you a little bit of a backdrop so we can see what's taking place here in chapter 14, and then we'll look at the first six verses. We know that in chapter 13, John has recorded that Jesus has just celebrated Passover with his disciples. And after the supper had ended, John records how he began to share with them and to teach them, because their world is about to change. They're about to become confused and anxious over events that will soon take place. You see, the things that he was saying was to prepare them for the events that would follow. Now, he had just given them a few things to think about. For example, in chapter 13, verse 18, He had said to them that one of them would betray him. He also told them that he would soon be leaving them. In chapter 13, verse 33, he said, Little children, I shall be with you a little while longer. You will seek me. And as I said to the Jews, where I am going, you cannot come. So now I say to you. So as he's sharing these things, he went on to tell the apostle Peter that the apostle would deny him three times. In verse 38, will you lay down your life for my sake? Jesus said to him, most assuredly I say to you, the rooster shall not crow till you've denied me three times. And so all of this that he's saying to them has combined to produce anxiousness in their hearts. As he had been there celebrating, Judas had left abruptly. And Jesus continued speaking and now he's been saying uncomfortable things. He had said, as mentioned a moment ago, where I'm going, you cannot come. And that caused the apostles to become agitated, confused, and even a bit concerned. But when he said, you will all deny me, it disturbed them. It especially struck the apostle Peter. In verse 37, Peter said in chapter 13, Lord, why can I not follow you now? I will lay down my life for your sake. So it especially bothered the apostle Peter. Now, in Peter's defense, he wasn't the only one who said something like this. Matthew 26, 35 tells us that Peter said to him, even if I have to die with you, I will not deny you. And so said all the disciples. So it wasn't just the apostle Peter that was saying that he'd lay his life down. The others who were there said the same kind of thing. Now, they should have been prepared. Jesus had been teaching about this more than once. From the beginning, he had made it clear that he would die, yet he'd be resurrected all the way at the beginning of his ministry, as recorded in John chapter 2, verses 19 through 22. Jesus had said, destroy this temple, and in three days I'll raise it up. The Jews said, it's taken 46 years to build this temple, and will you raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. Therefore, when he had risen from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this to them, and they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had said. Now, he had been teaching them, but they hadn't grasped what he was saying. In Mark chapter 9, verse 10, uh, Jesus had spoken about the Son of Man being risen from the dead. And in Mark 9, verse 10, they began to question what the rising from the dead meant. So Jesus was teaching them and preparing them, but they were yet to understand what he's saying. So in light of the fact that they didn't yet understand, Jesus keeps preparing them. He took into account their limitations. He understood them. And that's one of the things, by the way, that I'm blessed about with our Lord is he knows what we are. He understands. He knew what you would do when he gave you his gospel. He knew when you got saved what you would do with his gospel, and yet he gave it to you anyway, didn't he? He trusted you anyway, didn't he? He gave you that message, the only message 
that people need to adhere to, to believe, trust in, completely rely on in order to have eternal life. And yet he entrusted that to us. He knew what we were going to do because he knows us. Psalm 103 verse 14 says he knows our frame. He remembers we are dust. Well, it's now time for him to lay down his life. He knows his men are going to be devastated. And that's why he says in chapter 14 verse 1, let not your heart be troubled. That word troubled is an interesting Greek word. The word troubled speaks of being tossed and agitated. It's a picture of water that is being driven by wind. With that, we remind ourselves of the time Jesus and his men were in a storm on a lake. It's recorded in Mark chapter 4. Jesus had said to them, let us cross over to the other side. So they were making their way, and as, so, as doing so, a windstorm had arisen. The water began to fill the boat. The men began to panic. Their hearts were filled with fear. So they woke up Jesus, who was asleep at that moment, and they said, Teacher, don't you care that we are perishing? Well, his response was to stand up and rebuke the wind and sea, and he commanded the sea to be still. And then he asked, Why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? Well, this time he needs to still the storm in their hearts. He is able to still the storm on, on the sea, but it's more difficult to still the storm in a human heart. He saw their troubled hearts. Again, he speaks a word of comfort. He didn't want them overcome with sorrow and anxiety. So he says in verse 1, let not your heart be troubled. When he says let not, that gives to us insight that we can allow our faith to be overcome. Let not speaks about control that I have. I don't have to concern myself. I choose to. And that's why he says to them, let not your heart be troubled. Don't allow fear and anxiety to overrule. So what he's doing is he's, he's teaching them something, and he's encouraging them, and he's saying to them, let not your heart be troubled. Here's the remedy. This, is, this will strengthen you and keep you from being overwhelmed by anxiety. You believe in God. Believe also in me. Don't allow yourself, he's saying to them, be overwhelmed by the things that you're seeing and the things that are about to take place. Let not your heart be troubled. Like, the, like the, the waves of the sea and the wind that tosses them and, and all. You need to be still and know that I am God. You, you can resist yielding to anxiety. It's an act of your will. You see, it's not that they have no faith, but they must direct it towards the Lord. Now, by now, they should have known that he could do whatever he said he would do. John records various things that he'd been doing in front of them. They saw him turn water into wine heal a nobleman's son, heal a crippled man. They saw him feed 5,000. They saw him walk on water, heal a man born blind. And to top it off, they saw him raise Lazarus from the dead. Of all people, his disciples should have been able to trust him to keep his word. You see, in our times of confusion, fear, and sorrow, it's always best to turn to the Lord and trust in him. Psalm 56.3 says, whenever I'm afraid... I'll trust in you. And that's what we're supposed to do. Now, as Jesus is speaking here, I want to point something out here. Again, in verse 1, notice how he says, you believe in God, believe also in me. I want you to look at that with me. I'm going to develop something with you for just a moment. You see, those who think that he was only a prophet or a miracle worker or simply a good man or teacher, they have to pause at this place. Because Jesus just told them to have the same kind of faith in him that they have in God. He's literally saying, trust God and trust me. Put your full confidence in me. If God is worthy of complete and committed faith, he's saying, then so am I. Now, as a rabbi, he would never have encouraged his disciples to, to dishonor the Lord as a teacher he would not encourage any to give to him what only belongs to God. I mean, the Old Testament, Isaiah 42, verse 8, says it clearly. I am the Lord, that is my name, and my glory I will not give to another, nor my praise to graven images. We're not to give honor and glory to any but the Lord. Our faith is to be deposited in God himself. Yet here he is commanding his men to believe completely in him. He's pointing to himself as the object of the same faith given only to God John told us in chapter 5, verse 23, they are to honor him even as they honor the Father. And that's what Jesus is doing here. You believe in God, believe also in me. 
He's not simply a prophet. He's not simply a good man. He's not simply a teacher. He is claiming equality with God and commanding that believers trust him the way they trust God. That's what he's saying here. But he goes on in verse 2 and says, In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. In my Father's house there are many mansions. The word mansion is uh, literally dwelling places. It speaks of a house. It speaks of a resting place. So when he says, in my Father's house, well, he's speaking of heaven. Because heaven is the habitation of God. In Psalm 11, verse 4, the Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. So he's speaking concerning his father's house, in my father's house, and he's speaking in that, in that place of heaven. Now, it's interesting. I want to show you something. There's another place where Jesus uses the phrase, my father's house. That's found in John 2. In John chapter 2, verse 16, he uses that phrase when he cleanses the temple. In John 2, 16, he said to those who sold doves, take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of merchandise. So he used the phrase to speak to us concerning the holiness of the temple. So in using that phrase, my father's house, Jesus is making it clear that heaven is for genuine worshipers. It's not for the impure, but for those who have been cleansed. Heaven is not inhabited by those who are not believers in the true God. There's so many people, and I know that it, it rains on people's parade when people like me point this out, but it's true. There are people who think that the only thing to go to heaven that is required of an individual is for them to die. Everybody goes to heaven, right? You go to heaven. Everybody goes to heaven. Dogs go to heaven. I don't think cats do, but dogs do. <laughs> you know, everything goes to heaven. And that's true. I mean, you'll see some rock star. He was well known for whatever he used to do. And he dies, and then people will be talking about him, how he's up there looking down at us, because they think everybody goes to heaven. But does the Bible teach that? And is that what Jesus would teach? And the answer, quite obviously, is no. Jesus is making it clear that heaven is for genuine worshipers. It's not for the impure, but for those who've been cleansed. And heaven is not inhabited by those who don't believe in the true God through Christ. In the book of Revelation, the last book of the Bible, in chapter 22, verse 15, John said, outside the city are the dogs, the sorcerers, sexually immoral, murderers, idol worshipers, and all who love to live a lie. None of them are entering in. Heaven is not inhabited by those who are not true believers in Christ. But Jesus is making it clear that there's plenty of room in heaven. There is enough room for all who desire to be with him to come to heaven. But part of the requirement for entrance is revealed by your desire to be with him. You know, some want heaven, but they don't want him. And so the invitation is for those who want him. In Matthew 11, 28 through 30, Jesus gave invitation. He said, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, learn from me, for I'm gentle and lowly in heart. You'll find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So the stipulation is that we believe in him. If you believe in God, believe also in me. Now, people need to be told that they don't automatically go to heaven when they die. There are those who believe that there are many ways to enter into heaven, but Jesus didn't teach that. He taught that you need to be born again to enter into the kingdom of heaven. In Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 and 14, he said it like this. He said, enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. There are many who go in by it, because narrow is the gate and difficult is the, is the way which leads to life. And there are few who find it. You know, when I first got saved, I was 20 years old. And I was at a friend of mine's house. And he had asked somebody to come in and do some work on his home. And so this young man, who was close to my age, had come over to do some work. And I'm a brand new Christian. I haven't been a Christian more than just a few weeks at the most. And I had been taught, share your faith. And I was curious about what this guy believed in and all. And and so I still remember he was there in the front room, and, and I asked him, do you believe in Jesus Christ? And he said, yes, I do. I said, great, you're a Christian. He says, no, I'm not a Christian. I said, you're not? He goes, no. 
He says, I'm involved in what is called self-realization. I'd never heard of it. Self, he said, I'm part of the self-realization fellowship. And I said, uh, you know, I've never heard of that. And what is that? He says, we take the teachings of every great master and we apply them to our lives. He says, so we believe what Jesus said. We also believe what Buddha said and Muhammad said and, and Krishna and all of those. He said, we see them as all being equal, every one of them having truth that they communicate to us. And we embrace and believe and trust in the things that they say. That's what I do. I said, so I said, I, I have to be honest with you. I'm, I'm a new believer in Christ. I, I, I don't understand. I said, so I'm going to ask you to clarify for me, to help me, because I, I wasn't wanting to argue. I just wanted to know why he said he could believe in all of the things, especially, and I, again, I was a brand new Christian, but I knew there were contradictions there. And how do you embrace contradiction? I wasn't wise enough to do that. So I asked him, how do you embrace everything and say it's equally true? He says, because truth is universal and all truth is true. I said, that may be so. Does that mean that, that you believe everything Jesus said? And he said, yeah, I believe everything Jesus said. So I said, Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. Now, how is it that you say you trust in Buddha and Muhammad and Krishna when Jesus said, those guys can't get you to heaven, only he can? Now, I wasn't arguing with him. I wanted to hear his reasoning, and I wanted to know why you can say that when it's an obvious contradiction. So when I said that to him, he looks at me, and he says, I don't want to argue. And I said, neither do I, Jack. I just want to know, why do you say this when Jesus said that? I just want to embrace. I want to understand. What are you talking about? How can you believe everybody's true? Listen, a long time ago, C.S. Lewis, a great Christian thinker, said, either Jesus Christ is a liar, he's a lunatic, or he's the Lord. You can't have all three. And the things that Jesus said, either they're true or they're not true. And if they're not true, don't embrace it. If they are true, you'd better embrace it. You see, that's what I was raised up with, and that's what I teach and believe to this day. Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. And without him, you can't see the kingdom. He made it clear. So when I was speaking to him about this, he, he said I was arguing with him, which I have found to be a very common thing now. When people don't have an answer to a question, they just start getting mad at you for asking the question, which is what took place here. So I just scratched my head, and I wondered how you could believe things like that, because Jesus Christ made it very clear. So either you embrace what he said or you reject it, but there's no neutrality with it. And this is what he's doing here. He's speaking concerning truth. Again, Enter by the narrow gate. Wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. There are many who go in by it because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life. There are few who find it. So he says, you believe in God, believe also in me. Now, when he said you believe in God, believe also in me, simply believing that there is a God is not what he's referring to because simply believing that there is such a one as a God is not saving faith. That has been called devil faith. Because devils know who Jesus is. You might find that interesting. In Mark 1, 23 and 24, a man possessed by an evil spirit was in the synagogue. He began shouting, why are you bothering us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One sent from God. In James 2, 19, <laughs> here we go. <coughs> you believe that there is one God. You do well. Even the demons believe and tremble. That's called devil faith. You believe there's one God. That's good. But don't you understand? Devils believe too, and they tremble. You see, the faith that gains us entrance into heaven is saving faith in Jesus Christ. In Romans 4, verses 4 and 5, when people work, their wages are not a gift. Workers earn what they receive. But people are declared righteous because of their faith, not because of their work. And so Jesus is saying, you believe in God, believe also in me. And then says, in my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. If it were not so, I would have told you. If there were another way or a way that is yet to come, I would have told you, but there is no other way. So he's saying that they must trust and believe in him. 
You can believe me, he's saying, as I'm telling you the absolute truth, heaven is open for you. Now, notice he speaks of many mansions. There's plenty of room for all who would enter in by faith in him. One of my favorite scriptures, Revelation 7, 9, and 10, listen to this. John says, after these things I looked, and behold, a great multitude which no one could number of all nations, tribes, peoples, and tongues, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes, with palm branches in their hands, crying out with a loud voice, saying, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. What I love about this, and I want you to see this, I'll read it again. A great multitude which no one could number of all nations, tribes, peoples, and tongues. There's room for everybody. Heaven is not segregated. It's fully integrated. We go based on our faith in Jesus Christ. So there's not a you know, room over here for people of a certain ethnicity and then a place over here for others and then a place over here for others. It's all one. We're all one. Now, how can I illustrate this? Well, here's something interesting. I thought of it this morning. I'll share it again. I had my ancestry done. I wanted to know what I am. Turns out I'm human. Um, <laughs> so I did. A while back now. And so... I am 1% Italian and 9% English, 5% Portuguese. My last name, Rosales, is from Spain, right on the Portuguese border. There's a region there called Rosal. So that's where my last name comes from. So my last name comes from that region. So it didn't surprise me, 5% Portuguese. 2% Basque. No wonder I like Hialai. 33% Spanish. 42% Native American. No wonder when it's dry, I go outside and dance. Did I say 2% Bantu from Africa? So guess what? I'm every nation. So are you. So are you. You've got some Irish in you, some Italian in you, Swedish in you. You've got English in you, Native American in you. So who are we to run around saying, you don't belong here when we're all messed up? We all are. Every nation right here in this room, every nation is in this room, and you have many nations in you right now because of your ancestry. And we all come from Adam and Eve. It all comes from them, and that's how it works. And so when people run around saying, I'm better and you're less, that's just not true. There's no way that that's true. And so I love the idea that every nation, every tongue, every tribe, every people is welcome into heaven. And Jesus said, in my Father's house are many mansions. There's enough room for every person, but there's a requirement. The requirement is, believe in God, believe also in me. You don't go in because you're a good person. You don't go in because you try hard. You don't go in because you're very religious. You don't go in because you believe that there's such a thing as a God. You enter in because you've trusted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. You go in because you've cast your sins upon him and he has forgiven you and you're born again. That's how it works. See, that's called Christianity. And today a lot of people don't want to hear that message. They don't. They get mad. They don't want to hear that. But that's what Jesus taught. It's not exclusive in the way they say it. It's inclusive. Anyone can come to Christ. Anyone can come to faith in him if they desire. If they allow the Holy Spirit to work and to convict and draw them, they can be saved, everyone. And so Jesus made it very clear. There's plenty of room. You simply need to have faith in me. And then he says in verse 3, then he goes, he said, I go and prepare a place for you. I will come again and receive you to myself that where I am, there 
you may be also. I go that you might have a place in heaven. You're anxious. Do not let your heart be troubled. You're anxious about many things. But you need to understand that if I don't go, you can't come. In a, in a short while, he's about to be placed on a cross. He's going to die. They're going to have anxiety of heart. So he says, let not your heart be troubled. Trust me like you trust God. You see, my death and resurrection will make it possible for you to go to heaven, to be in those many mansions. And you have sorrow. And though you have sorrow now, your sorrow will turn to joy. Do not be troubled, because heaven is your home. In Colossians 1.5, that verse speaks of the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, of which you heard before in the word of truth of the gospel. In the book of Philippians, chapter 3, verse 20, Paul said, our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, heaven is a guaranteed and promised home of a believer. Somebody says, what happens when my believing mom or dad or friend, my relative dies? What happens? 2 Corinthians 5, 6 through 8, Paul tells us, we are always confident knowing that while we are at home in the body, we're absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. We are confident, yes, well pleased, rather, to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. There are those who are so in love with the earth, but heaven is to be preferred. Heaven is filled with the love of God and comfort. There are no tears, there's no sorrow, sickness, there's no pain. In Revelation 21, 4, God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. I've been at the bedside of more than one person who passed into eternity, and I have to tell you, the sorrow of their departure has been very great in my life. And the sense of loss for a believer is very intense. Sometimes you may feel that you don't have much faith because you sorrow so deeply. But you know what? God has given to believers a greater capacity to love. And when you have a greater capacity to love, you also have a greater capacity to hurt. But that's not sorrow of the world. We do not sorrow as those who have no hope. That's not our sorrow. It's just a deep sense of missing them. And that's what happens. But the bottom line is, in heaven, there's no tears, only joy. There's no sorrow. There's no more pain. I watched my mom as she went through great pain, and I rejoiced when mama went to be with Jesus. No more pain, no more tears, no more sorrow. And so I could actually rejoice. So I, I would miss my mom, and on occasion I think of her, and I do. Same with my dad. I loved my dad. Daddy went to be with Jesus. But you know what? I didn't lose him. I know where he's at. I didn't lose my mom. I know where she's at. And one day we'll be together. And that's a promise we have. Jesus said, in my Father's house are many mansions. I go and prepare a place for you. There's room for you. There'll be glad reunions, by the way, when you go to heaven. You're going to go in there and you're going to look and you're going to see people and you're going to say to them, how'd you get here? I didn't think you were going to make it. <laughs> and they're going to look at you saying, uh, well, I could say the same about you. How'd you get in here? But the bottom line is there's plenty of room for us. It's a place filled with joy. In Psalm 16, verse 11, you will show me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Heaven is a place that's filled with glory behind, beyond description. In Romans 8, 18, Paul said, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. Heaven is a place that we finally will have the bodies that we wish we had. You know, uh, a lot of people are going to be making New Year's resolution. You know, I'm going to go work out at the gym, and you're going to go just, man, you're going to hit those weights, and then the next day you're going to wake up and your body's going to be screaming in pain, and you're going to say, well, you know, I don't have to go today. <laughs> and that'll be the rest of it for the rest of the year. Well, I tried. Well, in heaven, we have the bodies we wish we had. In Philippians 3.21, he will transform our lowly body that it may be conformed to his glorious body according to the working by which he's able even to subdue all things to himself. 
In heaven, we receive heavenly reward. Remember, salvation is a gift, but rewards are given for service. In Revelation 22:12, 12, Jesus said, Behold, I'm coming soon. My reward is with me, and I will give to everyone according to what he has done. So with the knowledge that we receive reward, that provokes us to discipline. Paul said it in 1 Corinthians 9, 24 through 27. Do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but one receives a prize? Run in such a way that you may obtain it. And everyone who competes for the prize is temperate in all things. Now, they do it to obtain a perishable crown, but we for an imperishable crown. Therefore, I run thus, not with uncertainty. Thus, I fight, not as one who beats the air, but I discipline my body and bring it into subjection, lest when I preach to others, I myself should become disqualified. So we discipline our lives. You see, those who do not go to heaven very often don't go because they don't want to. They reject Jesus. They refuse his invitation. They dismiss the opportunity. But Jesus said in verse 3, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am there you may be also. Now, notice he doesn't say he's coming to earth to establish his kingdom. He says he's coming to take us to be with him. This speaks of the rapture. He's taking believers from earth to live with him in heaven. Paul says something of that in 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18. I don't want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, with the trumpet of God. The dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore comfort one another with these words. He says, I go to prepare a place for you. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself. Now, where I am, there you may be also. In verse 4, where I go, you know, and the way, you know. I've taught you this path. I've taught you the way to heaven. I've done so for all of these years. You know the way. But here we go with Thomas. Thomas said to him in verse 5, Lord, <laughs> we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? We don't know where you're going. How can we? You just said, where I'm going, you cannot come. And now you're saying you're going to come and get us. Can you please clarify this for me? And then Jesus said it like this. Verse 6. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. When you read the Gospel of John... He has what are called the seven I am statements. Seven times in the gospel, he refers to himself using the term I am. He says, I'm the bread of life, for example. I am the light of the world. I am the door of the, the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I am the resurrection and the life. This is his sixth I am statement. I am, he says, the way, the truth, and the life. So he's saying, I am the way. To God, I and I alone, and there is none beside me. I am the way, not a way, not one of the ways. I am the way is what he's saying. You know, there is a way that seems right unto a man, but the end thereof is the way of death. Somebody can think I'm religious, or I try to be holy, I try to do good things, I'm very generous, or I go to church, go to synagogue, go to whatever, and, and I'm trying to be a very religious person, and they think that that's what God requires of them, and that isn't what he says. No, you, it, it's, not, it's not all the good things that you try to do. It's the fact that he's done something on my behalf. But I can have a way that is right in my own eyes, and it is the end, and the end thereof is a way of death. The other day, my wife Marie and I, were, we went off to the beach, and we were coming home, and I was running out of gas, so I pulled off the freeway and started looking for a gas station. I was in the left, <laughs> excuse me, left turn lane. 
And I, I took my left. We're talking. I took my left turn. And, I'm, and there were five lanes, and so I went to the outside. But as I was going to the outside, I see an island that's on my right side. And I say to myself, you're going in the wrong direction. I'm not used to seeing five lanes of traffic coming in the same way, so I'm assuming by going all the way to the end like that that I'm on the right place. But the car, there's a car starting to honk like that at me as I'm going up, and I see this whole line of cars coming directly at me. And I look to Marie for a moment, and she's, she's, she, 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 she was doing a rosary. I mean, she went all the way, <laughs> all the way back to fear. <laughs> just kidding. She had her eyes closed. Uh, she, we were just talking about it. She could, she, when Marie gets scared, she'll just make a little whimper sound. She'll go, ah, and that's what she did. She goes, ah, like that. So I made a quick U. Now, see, when my father, what, my father was a truck driver, and my father didn't like to admit when he was going the wrong way. He, he wouldn't. He just wouldn't. Because he drove, that was his job. He was always driving, so he's all, he knew every, you know, the map was really like the back of his hand. But there were times when my father went in the wrong direction. And my mom would be sitting there on the passenger side, and she'd look at him, and she'd say, Frank, are you lost? And my dad would always say the same thing. No, no, I'm not lost. I've, I've always wanted to know what this street looks like. That's what my dad would say. I've always wanted to know what this street looks like. <laughs> he was lost. We don't like to admit we're lost. Men don't like to admit. Maybe women the same way, I don't know, but you ladies, maybe you can say, yeah, husbands, who needs a map? Who needs a nav? You know, I can do it. I got it all in here, right? That kind of thing. And then we get lost. Then you say, do you know where you're going? Well, that's what happened. I turned left and I made a U-turn. And I said, you know, I always wanted to make an illegal U-turn in front of oncoming, <laughs> oncoming traffic. Man, those cars are all freaking out. Those people, those drivers, honk, honk, honk. And I'm making this U-turn and went back. And Marie's all like, what do you do? What did you do? I said, I don't know. I said, I, I, said, I, I, I got confused. We were talking and I wasn't paying attention. And it looked like I, went, I had all the excuses. But there's a way that seems right unto a man. And the end thereof is the way of death. There is a way. And it's the right way. And there are a lot of people who think they're going the right way. And Jesus said, they're not. You're going towards head-on traffic. It is going to kill you. The end thereof is a way of death. You think you're going in the right direction. You're not. You're going in the wrong direction. It's going to end up with tragedy. And so he says, I'm the way, not a way, one of the ways. He's saying, I am the way. I am the exclusive way. It's like what Paul later says in 1 Timothy 2.15. There's one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. Then he says, I am the truth. I'm not one dimension of truth. I'm not someone with a little bit of truth. I am truth. God is light, and in him is no darkness. God is truth, and Jesus reveals this. So Jesus' words must be believed because he's exposing the lie of the enemy. And then he says, I am the life. I am eternal life. I am resurrection life. It's all wrapped up in me. I am the giver of life. I'm the source and originator of it because I am it. In John eleven twenty five 25 through 27, Jesus was speaking to Martha. And he says, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live, even if he dies. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, yes, Lord, I have believed that you are the Christ, the Son of God, even he who comes into the world. It's one thing he makes this dogmatic statement, I'm the resurrection and the life. Believe in me, you will never die. That's a statement. But with the statement comes a question, do you believe? Because there are a lot of people who could go to a catechism class and write the right class, you know, the answer to the question. I learned to do that. Many of you did too. I learned what they said. They said, this is the answer to that. I had my little missile, my booklet, whatever it was, and I memorized the things. And so I, I'm in the class, and they say, this is what this means. And then we would take our little test. We'd get a little gold or silver star at the end. And that's what we did. 
So I was able to answer questions because I memorized answers. But there's a difference between actually believing or simply parroting. There's a difference between saying what you think others want you to say because it's a right and believing it so that it doesn't matter if anybody else believes it. It's right. And so Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. Do you believe this? And that's a powerful question. Yes, Lord, I believe. That's what we all need to say. How are we going to get into heaven? By saying, God, I'm a sinner. I need your blood to wash me of my sin, to cleanse me of my unrighteousness. I was born in sin. I live in sin. I sin because it's natural. And God, I'm so tired of it, and I'm so fatigued, and I'm so worn down by this life. God, forgive me, a sinner. I need some help. Forgive me. That's what I did. December 27th, 1970, 48 years ago, that's how I got saved. And that's how you got saved. When you said, God, forgive me, a sinner. I believe. And I am all in. It's like I'm in you know, a card game. I have all these chips. And I'm not keeping a couple stacks to myself. I'm all in. I push it all in. I'm completely in. Totally. Everything is on this promise. I believe. Fully committed. Following you. You're the way. You're the truth. And you are the life. And no one comes to the Father except through you. So to be saved requires faith in Jesus alone because he is the exclusive way to God. Acts 4.12, nor is there salvation in any other. There is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. So Christmas, Santa Claus, no. Reindeer, no. Jesus, yes, Jesus. Remember, that that infant that was placed in a manger was placed on a cross, was placed in a tomb, and is now seated at the right hand of the Father. That's the one that we worship. That baby grew up to lay his life down. He didn't stay an infant. He grew to be a man, and he laid his life down for us. And he's saying, I am the resurrection and the life. Do you believe and my response is, yes, Lord, I believe. You are the King of kings. You are the Lord of glory. You are my Savior. And one day I will see you face to face. You have a place that you've set for me, a mansion that I one day will dwell in, and I will be with you. I will see my mom. I'll see my dad. I'll see my loved ones. That's what it is. And that's why, and that's why we can say, Merry Christmas.